In this video, we're going to take our very first look at Newton's second law. Forces cause accelerations, which is what Newton's second law tells us. It's terribly important that we understand that forces do not cause motion, but forces cause changes in motion, and that we're really going to try to explore in this video. But first, I want you to do an experiment. Pause the video and throw your textbook, well, throw any book that you have, on the ground across the room till it slides to a stop. That's okay, go ahead and pause the video and then come back when you're done. What did that look like? So you gave the book some velocity and when it started sliding, it got slower and slower until it finally came to a rest. After it left your hand, it had some motion and it was a force due to friction which slowed it down. Let's take a look at that. Now we're just going to be working in one dimension. We're sliding in 1D. And so we're going to ignore any forces or component of forces in the vertical dimension. Just look horizontally. After it leaves your hand, the only force is the contact force by the ground on the book, which is friction. If the book is moving to the right, then there is a friction force here to the left. Let's give ourselves some numbers. We start with a velocity of 12 meters per second, and there's a force of 8 newtons. I'm not going to write units for everything. We'll be up working in SI. So if we use Newton's second law, it says that the net force, and this time there's only one, is equal to the mass times the acceleration in vector form. Well, in this vector form, in our one-dimensional notation, that's an 8 pointing in the negative x direction is equal to the mass, which is 2 kilograms times the acceleration, which gives us an acceleration of negative 4. Since the acceleration is constant, we know from before we can derive the velocity as a function of time, which is just the initial velocity as t is equal to zero, plus the acceleration times time, which is then 12 minus 4t. Notice that this describes the velocity changing. It starts with 12 and then it decreases as a function of time. So it eventually stops, and we can calculate when that does. If we set the velocity function equal to zero, that's where it no longer has any speed and it comes to rest. And then we solve for the time at which that happens and we find it happens in t is equal to 3 seconds. Briefly, let's take a look at the graphical representation of that. Here's acceleration as a function of time, velocity as a function of time. The acceleration is constant, but the velocity decreases from 12 to 0. The changing velocity comes from the acceleration. The acceleration comes from the force. Just for fun, let's look at the whole thing. I mean, where did that motion come from? Here I've drawn you. You're about to slide the book across the floor. So as you're holding it, both the velocity and the acceleration are equal to 0. Up to the point where it releases, you are now accelerating the book forward. So you give it a large acceleration, and during that time where you're moving your arm, the velocity then increases. So that's where the motion comes from from something at rest. A force, in this car, you exerting a force on the book, gives it an acceleration, which gives it some velocity up to the point where it leaves your hand. In this region right here, let's assume it hasn't quite hit the floor yet. This is where you've thrown the book. And so for a brief moment of time, it hasn't hit the floor, but it has left your hand. Assuming there's no air resistance, there's no acceleration because there's no net force during this time, which means the velocity doesn't change in this interval. Now, I've not also violated sort of my one-dimensional, but we're just going to assume it's barely over the surface, and so we can sort of ignore anything going on in the vertical dimension. So after it leaves your hand before it hits the floor, no force, no acceleration, which means the velocity doesn't change. So here it has a velocity, but no force, because it doesn't need a force for a velocity. It only needs a force to change velocity. And then finally, it hits the ground, and then it slides to rest. It's at this point where we have a force opposing the motion, which gives it a negative acceleration, which, bring, which changes the velocity from 12 meters per second to zero. Let's go back to our original example. So we have the book, it's sliding across, it has a velocity of 12 meters per second in the positive x direction, and there's a force of friction in the other direction equal to 8 newtons. But, aha, in this case, your cat is following behind the book, trying to push it to keep it going. So the cat exerts a force of 4 newtons in the positive x direction. And so here I've drawn a little diagram showing the two forces. 
there's the motion is in the positive x, there's a force of friction in the negative x, and now the force of the cat in the positive x direction, which is a contact force. So what happens? So we have to calculate the net force. And so we can do that. The net force, then, is the vector sum of these two forces. So in my one-dimensional notation, 8 in the negative x direction is just a negative 8, and 4 is positive 4, which gives me a net force of magnitude 4 pointing in the negative x direction, which is what the sign means, equals to ma, mass is still 2, so an acceleration of negative 2 meters per second, or a magnitude of 2 in the negative x direction. So we can calculate the velocity as a function of time, which in this case looks like 12 minus 2. It's still decreasing. We can find out when it comes to rest, which is now 6 seconds later. So just to remind ourselves what happened before here. This is case 1. You remember in case 1 we had an, accel an acceleration of negative 4 meters per second squared, which brought us from 12 meters per second to zero in three seconds. But in this case, we have a lower acceleration because we had a lower net force, and that led us to go from 12 meters per second to zero in six seconds. We had two forces in this instance, but the result was simply a net force which was smaller, which gave us a lower acceleration, which meant it took longer to bring the velocity to zero but still we have the force leading to acceleration, which led to the change in velocity. All right, the final time, I promise. You probably saw this coming. Let's return to the book sliding across the floor, but this time your cat is really aggressive and is giving it a contact force of eight newtons in the positive x direction, and that equals the force of friction. So what happens now? Well, we calculate the net force like we did before, only this case, we have the negative 8 frictional force plus the 8 contact force from the cat is equal to 0. And if the net force is 0, then the acceleration is 0. If the acceleration is 0, then we can calculate the velocity as a function of time, which doesn't change and stays 12 meters per second forever. Well, at least until it hits the wall and the wall exerts a force but some forevers last longer than others. Let's take a look at the graph. So I brought back the picture that we had before. There's this time at the beginning where nothing is happening. You're holding the book at rest. And then you accelerate the book forward. There's this moment where there's no force at all on it, where it maintains its velocity because there's no acceleration because there's no force. Then when it hits the ground, in this example, there's the force of friction, but there's also the cat, so there's two forces, but no net force. And because there's no net force, the acceleration is zero, and this, because that's zero, the velocity doesn't change. I know we went into a lot of detail on this one. Everyone has an intuition about forces leading to velocities due to just living in the world. And I can't just tell you that forces lead to accelerations and they're just flip a switch and say, oh, okay. It's important to go through and work hard to rebuild your intuition about forces leading to changes in velocity, because only then will you be able to build a Newtonian intuition to help you solve these problems.